expansion. For all of human history, for the vast majority of human history, humans lived on current sunlight. Sun fell on the fields, the fields grew plants, the plants made cellulose, plant matter, animals ate the cellulose, we ate the plants, we ate the animals, we wore clothing made out of the plants and animals. We were living off of current sunlight. It was our food supply, it was our clothing, we heated with wood, it was our heat supply, it was our light supply, it was all current sunlight. So the sunlight that fell on the earth in a year was the maximum amount of sunlight that we could use. It was the maximum amount of energy that we could use. And from, from the earliest evidence of human civilization 150,000 more or less years ago, up until a few thousand years ago, pretty much that's how we lived. And our population never surpassed a billion people. And then we began discovering that there were these little pockets of ancient sunlight, you know, finding coal here and a little bit of oil there. And slowly, between that and the agricultural revolution, slowly our population crept up until we hit our first one billion people. And so uh, it didn't take us 100,000 years to go from one billion to two billion. Our second billion only took us 130 years. We hit two billion people in 1930. Our third billion took only 30 years, 1960. It's amazing when you think about it. When John Kennedy was inaugurated, there were half as many people on the planet as there are today. And the reason that we've been able to have this exponential growth of population is because we're creating food and clothing and everything else, transportation, we're, we're doing it all with this ancient sunlight that was stored in the Earth three and four hundred million years ago. And if we were to have to go back to simply living off current sunlight, lacking technology, the planet couldn't sustain more than a half a billion to, at the most, a billion people. The real problem is that there are too many of us using too many resources too fast. Now, oil has enabled us to do that. We use oil to increase the rate at which we extract all other resources, everything from topsoil to fresh water to from aluminum to zinc. At the time of Christ, there were about 300 million people on the planet which had somehow about doubled by the end of the 18th century when coal came on, then came good old oil, and suddenly the population went up six times. I don't think that we could sustain the present population of the globe, much less what it will be in 20 or 30 years, uh, without the use of petrochemicals. Does it mean we've got to go back to a population not much different from what it was before oil. In the absence of fossil fuels, how many people can the world support? Many people believe maybe a billion and a half, two billion people. You don't often hope you're wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. Everybody I know who's concerned about peak oil hopes they're wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. I don't think they're wrong. But surely an aware society can learn to live sustainably. The term sustainable development is a contradiction in terms we can have no kind of development. We've gone much too far. What we need is a sustainable retreat from the mess that we're now in. We have perhaps one in four mammals now on the threatened list. We have one third of all amphibians on the threatened list. So we know that we are progressively pushing more and more species to the edge of extinction. We have lost half of the world's forests half of the world's wetlands, half of the world's grasslands. We are systematically eradicating many of the habitats that make up the world's ecosystems. Species after species of animals have been going extinct, but the crisis that we face now is that the rate of extinction is accelerating and that it will really reach biblical proportions within a few decades. We now face an extinction episode on this planet comparable to that which marked the end of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago, largely driven by habitat change, driven by the release of pollution into the environment, by global warming. All these things are combining 
in a series of forces that's likely to lead, if we don't take action very soon, to the extinction of a large proportion of this Earth's wildlife species. So is the ultimate problem for wilderness worldwide that there are simply too many people? One thing that's always worried me about the environment movement for the last 30 years is their inability to get their heads around the importance of population. I find it staggering that that is still downgraded as an issue. There's a sense it's somehow politically incorrect to talk about population. But the issue of population lies absolutely at the heart of the destruction of the natural world today. If we had to find a way of creating a sustainable future for a billion people, I can assure you it would be a great deal simpler and a lot better for the natural world than trying to find a solution for six billion people, let alone nine billion people, which will be the population of this planet by the middle of this century, by 2050. So ignoring population strikes me as the biggest own goal that the environment movement has ever scored. I wouldn't like to, so to speak, to push the problem off onto overpopulation in the way that has sometimes been fashionable. You know, people saying, well, the, the real problem about the environment is that there are too many people in Africa and India, usually. Um, in other words, it's not about us. So overpopulation has to be seen as a, a global issue, not just something that we can tell other people to do something about. If we all live on this planet the way Americans currently live, we would need three planets to support the Earth's current population. The trouble is that much of the rest of the world wants to live and spend like Americans. The conventional view is um, the, that the economy is there to produce goods and services, and the more we produce and consume, the better off we'll be. Um, but there's a lot of evidence to show that that's not really the case. Consumption of goods and services only improves people's sense of satisfaction up to a fairly low threshold, beyond which it becomes counterproductive in terms of their, their long-term well-being. Our focus on consumption is a, is a form of, of uh, psychological junk food. It's something that makes us feel good temporarily, but in the end, uh, it makes us unhealthy. Still, consumerism would have less impact on the planet if there weren't so many people. There are six billion of us now. How many should there be? When one tries to get at a number, my guess is somewhere between 500 million people and uh, one billion, no more than that. I think that the Earth can safely support in a sustainable way and at a reasonable standard of living about half of what it has today. And I think that that would make the people happier and it would certainly make the, the planet happier. We'd have more diversity, we'd have plenty of productivity, we'd be able to maintain our cultural diversity, and the world would be a much more sustainable place. Now, choosing how to get from where we are to where we need to be is the crunch. As population grows, one of the first resources to come under pressure is fresh water. For example, the mighty Colorado River that carved out the Grand Canyon isn't very mighty anymore. Well, the Colorado actually is uh, no longer reaching the sea in most years. Um, and this is a very clear sign that the health of the river is in pretty bad shape. And so there's a disconnection of ecological service here. That river's job is to deliver fresh water and nutrients and sediment to deltas. And they're no longer doing that work. And that has an implication for the species that live there. Uh, and so in the case of the Colorado, we see you know, signs of diminishing productivity in the fisheries um, in the upper Gulf of California. We've gone about meeting these human needs in a very simple way, which is every time we need more water, we go out and find it. We tap another river, we build another dam, we tap more groundwater, um, and take more out of the natural world. Like almost every other big river in the world, the Colorado has been dammed. You know, just 50 years ago, around 1950, we had 5,000 large dams around the world. Today, we have 45,000 large dams around the world. Uh, which means we've been building two large dams every day for half a century. Um, so this is a very, very large change in the hydrologic environment. And dams don't always stop at generating electricity. They also extract water for irrigation. 
We have to take a lot of water out of the natural world in order to put it on cropland. Um, and this land is really important to us. Um, we do get 40% of our food from irrigated land, even though that land makes up less than 20% of the whole cropland base. So it's really important land. Um, but it requires that we intervene in a major way into the hydrologic cycle. 70% um, of all the water we take out of rivers, lakes, aquifers goes to irrigation. So it consumes the lion's share of the water that we're taking out of the natural world. 